Hello, my little snow cones. This is Movies, Music, and Moods. I'm Noe, and this is a podcast journal for me to talk about what I think is magic and mystifying and memeable about the movies I watch and the music that I listen to. So let's get started. This week, the movie is Big Eyes from 2014, and the album is Blue Finger by Black Francis from 2007. So first, let's dig into the album. So this is a Black Francis album, and I've already talked about Frank Black on the podcast. I love Frank Black. When I decided to do this album, it was just so nice to listen to him again. I drew this funny little comic of me reaching up at a heart balloon that says Frank Black on it. Obviously, I was inspired by the album cover for this one. But of course, Black Francis, Frank Black. Charles Michael Kittredge Thompson IV from the Pixies. They're all the same person. And this is a completely new album for me, Blue Finger. I love an opportunity to learn. So I really wanted to choose this one, not just because a lot of the songs were really resonating with me, but I think it's an interesting story to tell. And it's actually a concept album. I've said this before. I'm a fan of concept albums in general. And it's a concept album specifically about the life and times of the Dutch rock and roller, actor, painter, poet, Ermin Brot. I was not aware of Brot's existence before this. He was basically the epitome of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I do want to mention before we get into everything today, I want to throw out content warnings for substance abuse disorder And I'm also going to be mentioning suicide in relation to the life of Airman Brot. So if that's something you just don't think you can deal with today, this episode might not be great to listen to for you right now. You can skip ahead to the movie or put a different episode on. And I really want to talk about these subjects as sensitively as I can. So I apologize for any missteps. I'm just going to assume that Frank Black slash Black Francis. Hmm. I'm going to say Frank Black, okay? That's just what I'm used to. But I'm going to say that Frank Black is probably using a lot of the same language that Airman Brote used in his life and in his music to describe himself. But the language might not be like the most current. Getting back to the album, being completely ignorant of Airman Brote's music, I did check out some of it, particularly his work with his backing band, his wild romance. I can see why he's considered the greatest and only Dutch rock and roll star. I don't I can't speak for the only part of that. I apologize to the Netherlands if you've had a bunch of other rock and roll stars, but it says he's the greatest. So we'll go with that. And I can see why he would be so popular. He had this really intense energy on stage and just in general. What stuck out to me with his work with his wild romance is that the music is clean, but his vocals are so earthy and raw. I love the female backing vocals. I really had no idea what to expect, but I can definitely see that he would have provided some inspiration to Frank Black's music. And just reading about him briefly, I can definitely understand Frank Black's fascination and reverence for him. I mean, he devoted an entire album to him and his life. And it's always interesting to see who your favorite musicians were inspired by. Brooke was also a painter, and his work is definitely like pop art. He did paintings and murals and screen prints. His style uses really bright colors, a lot of primary colors, and thick black lines. And you can see him in his art. I know it's really common for artists to, without without ever meaning to kind of paint themselves into their work. I mean, you see yourself the most out of anyone. So whether he meant to or not, I I did see his face in a lot of his paintings. Kind of reminds me of Bowie, too. I mean, Bowie did do self-portraits. Brut was an artist through and through. I am by no means an expert on Airman Brut's life at this point. Kind of just wanted the album to wash over me and see what information I picked up. I do see that there is at least one movie about his life, so that might be worth checking out. I know I said that I love an album that I can learn from. I'm going to be honest, I probably am not picking up on like 50% of the drug references in this album. So let's do a quick rundown of the personnel. Musicians. 
Black Francis on vocals, guitar, harmonica, and keyboards, Dan Schmid on bass, Jason Carter on drums, Violet Clark, vocals, and Mark Lemhouse, percussion and background vocals. Let's get into the magic. First magic song, it's the first song on the album, Captain Pasty. This is a really high energy song. So Aaron Brode had an airplane tattoo, and obviously the song is like airplane pilot themed. It reminds me of Los Angeles by Frank Black. I'm not going to call it Los, Los Angeles. But I think this is a real fun-ass start to the album. That's what I wrote. I love the line, I'm just lucky to be alive. It's a seemingly simple song. It's really fast and strummy. And one thing, one of the many things I love about Frank Black is that you're always going to get really great vocab words like alabaster. And his vocals are so unpredictable. He, he throws so much emotion into his singing. He'll be yelping and screaming. You name it. He'll, he'll do it in the recording studio. But I just think that the emotion you get from him is so cool. It's just excellent. The next song is also airplane themed. The next magic song is Test Pilot Blues. This one's great. It really reminds me of how Oingo Boingo was really inspired by like 1930s jazz. It's kind of ska. The reference to airplanes and crashing I think work really well. This is a a sort of dark sounding song. The character sounds exasperated. The test pilot crashing theme on this one could easily be a metaphor for drugs, getting high, you know, hitting rock bottom. And there are a few songs on this one that allude to things like that. The next song that I think is magic on Bluefinger is Angels Come to Comfort You. And this song references Airman Brote's death. I know he mentioned substance abuse disorder, but Brot struggled with that his entire life, and he was severely depressed from not being able to recover from substance abuse. Wikipedia just says that he also had medical problems. Brot died by suicide from throwing himself off the roof of the Hilton Hotel in Amsterdam. This was on July 11, 2001, and he was 54 years old. This is one of the songs that mentions Brote directly by name. The beginning is really sweet, too. Frank Black says in Dutch, may I speak English? Kind of obsessed with the lyrics to this one. It starts off after the Dutch part. Frank Black sings, I saw the statue of Airman Brote. It had a lump weighed down in its throat. That's because its heart was broken, too. I think this song is extremely touching. I think it's what you would hope for if you wrote a song for someone you admire. The image of him being comforted by angels after his death is beautiful. He sings, they will break your fall. The choral backing vocals sound like angels singing, right? They're angelic. And the song really does tell a story. It's what you'd expect from a concept album. The very end, you hear the ambulances. So it paints a picture of Brote's life and death. I think if you admired Brote personally, like if you knew him or he was an artist that you just loved, you would want to think that there was something soft and sweet waiting for him at the end of such a brutal death. I know that's really heavy. I'm sorry. And maybe it's just the person in me who likes to imagine movies whenever I'm listening to a concept album, but this is not the last song on the album. And this makes me wish that I had seen the musical based on the album that was performed in 2010, interestingly. The next magic song is Your Mouth Into Mine. You won't get a perfectly packaged little love song from Frank Black. This this in Discotech 36 is probably the closest you'll get. And I think despite the forceful and overtly sexual language in this one, it's a really sweet song. I love the really casual offhand sort of line where he sings, I got into your heart. It was no big deal. The next magic song, because I have a lot of magic songs on this one. I should have told you to prepare yourself. But the next magic one is Discotech 36. It might just be the chord progressions on this one. But this song just seems so familiar to me. I feel like I've heard it before. This is another love song. This one's a little sweeter than the other one. It does feature more direct drug and alcohol references. Also, 36 on the Richter scale is completely insane. 
It just sounds like I've known it for years. And it does get in my head a lot. But I'm not giving this one the award of most likely to get stuck in your head. I actually changed that one a couple times just based on which ones did get stuck in my head. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the first song I'll be mentioning that I just feel like the backing vocals by Violet Clark don't totally work for me, just personally. The lyrics to this one are great. I love Isn't That Something, how I thought that I'd seen every woman that there was to be seen. Um, I appreciated the reference to Salty Drop, which is a Dutch licorice thing. And I know that because I'm going to reveal right now that I'm a lover of licorice. Not necessarily salty licorice, though. I had some in Holland, Michigan, thinking I could handle it, and I absolutely could not. So that really put me in my place. So the last song that I think is magic on the album is the last song on the album, Bluefinger. And Bluefinger is sometimes what the citizens of Svola are called. And Airman Brote was born in Svola. The song is beautiful and very sad. You definitely feel a sense of resignation from the character singing. It, and it feels less like acceptance and more like sheer stubbornness to me. He sings, if my choices were poor, I made them. That line really stands out to me. And unfortunately, this is another one where the backing vocals by Clark just are more of a distraction for me than anything. But it's definitely still a beautiful song and a beautiful way to end the album. But we're not done yet because that was everything I thought was magic. But what did I think was mystifying? She Took All the Money is the first song I felt was mystifying. I know I've said before on a lot of albums that there are some songs I just hate. I'm not a fan of this one. I really hate the Shamalama Ding Dong line. And I hated just saying it just now. And because of my dislike for that popping up in the verses and the chorus, um, it's hard for me to rightfully judge the rest of the song. Again, I think the backing vocals for this are cloying. So sorry. It's obviously a very sad song. Like this man, if this is Airman Brote specifically, is miserable. You know, he he owns up to his substance abuse. And that's all I'm going to say about that one. So there is another mystifying track that I want to talk about, and that is You Can't Break a Heart and Have It. And this is the only song on the album that is a Brote cover. So I do kind of feel bad about this one. But to me, it's just not as interesting as the original. The original is really frantic and brooding, and there's just something dark about it. Whereas Frank Black kind of props it up and gives us a kind of fairly sanitized version, which is really weird to say about Frank Black like ever, but I just think it lost the teeth that the original had and a bit of the funk. Maybe I just missed the saxophone. There's a version on Daily Motion. There's a really great saxophone solo. Next up is memeable. What did I find memeable? I wouldn't say that this is a memeable album. Definitely out of respect for the life of Airman Brote. I wouldn't like to say that it's memeable. Is it worthy of turning into a musical? Yes, absolutely. But if I am going to pick something that could be memeable, I would say Threshold Apprehension. This one is honestly just out of control. The chorus is gorgeous, which is kind of funny. Like the juxtaposition between the chorus being very beautiful and the verses just being wild is very good. I think it works really well. The lyrics are outrageous. And it really has like a painful sound to it in parts. Frank Black at one point sounds like he's holding his head in his hands while he's singing, like he's grabbing his face or something. This is a great one overall and the only one that I would deem memeable. When I first listened to this one, I heard the line about him being a Scorpio dog and was like, Frank Black's not even a Scorpio because I know things like that. And and no, it's not helping my life. But I do know these things. Um, Airman Brote is a Scorpio. He was born November 5th. Okay, I like I like that little inclusion. Now, the song most likely to get stuck in your head, Tight Black Rubber. This one at first was was really just not my favorite. It's very like macho posturing. The rhyme right off the bat of beautiful and dutiful was annoying to me, quite frankly. But it is funny. Frank Black has fun with his music. And maybe it's a reference. I'm probably missing all of these references. 
But the song is scary and kind of stupid. And this is like pure deviant Frank Black, probably trying to like invoke the spirit of Airman Brot. At first, I definitely felt like it moved forward aimlessly. And I was going to say that Lolita was the song that would get stuck in your head the most. But Type Black Rubber is the one that gets stuck in my head the most. I woke up with it in my head today before I recorded. I I think that says it all. And finally, the award for most likely to be the song you hitch a ride on a boxcar and leave town to, Lolita. I think this is just a pretty song about like being at your worst and hitting rock bottom, but still having some sense of, of empowerment. And it's also very much possibly about the lows of drug use. This is another one where I'm interested in the reference to Lolita, or maybe I should say I'm not super interested in the reference to Lolita. I'm like, uh, curious, I guess. So overall, I'm so glad that I checked this one out. I'm glad I got to learn a bit about Brute's life. And it really just made me even more empathetic for those who struggle with substance abuse disorder and for those who struggle with their mental health. Life can be very hard. Those are my final thoughts for Bluefinger by Black Francis. So let's move along to the movie. And this episode, we're going to talk about Big Eyes from 2014. Tim Burton was the director and producer. And I have some things to say about Tim Burton. This is going to be very similar to my rant about Wes Anderson. So like a lot of other millennials, I'm a Tim Burton fan. Some of my absolute favorite movies are From the Skull of Tim Burton. Edward Scissorhands, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Beetlejuice, Nightmare Before Christmas, Big Fish, the Batman movies. You'll notice most of those are his earlier movies. And that's because as time has gone on, I wish someone would say to Tim Burton, hey, you're not allowed to use all that CGI. Can you please rein it in a little bit? He has a style. And in the past, I've greatly admired it. Absolutely. But sometimes I just wish someone would say no to him. I'm talking about Alice in Wonderland. I really didn't even like Corpse Bride. Um, Sweeney Todd was fine. I just don't really have the stomach for it. I would just like to see a new Tim Burton movie that really wowed me, but I'm not so sure that that's in the cards for now. I also am probably going to be complaining a bit about Danny Elfman, but when it comes to Oingo Boingo, I'm not going to say one bad thing about Danny Elfman, okay? I'm mostly just going to complain about his movie score briefly for this particular movie. So Big Eyes is about the real-life artist Margaret Keane, whose second husband, Walter Keene, basically took credit for all of her art for years until they were involved in a court battle, proving that she had actually been painting the Big Eyes kids all along. Some interesting little tidbits I read about the movie is that this was the first Tim Burton movie edited by someone other than Chris Levinson, because he was busy working on Maleficent. It's, and it's possible that a lot of people think Maleficent is a Tim Burton movie, I notice that anything that is vaguely related in style to Tim Burton, everyone assumes is him. Um, Coraline gets mixed up a lot. Coraline is a Henry Selleck movie. The book was written by Neil Gaiman. I honestly really just need to get that off my chest, okay? One of the first picks for Walter Keene was actually Thomas Hayden Church, who, if you look at a picture of Walter Keene, I see the resemblance there. I I can see that. And Margaret Keene just passed away in 2022. She's actually in the movie, and that scene where they're in the park, she's sitting on the bench in the background. As usual, me and my husband had some predictions for this one. His was that the daughter would be key to finding out that Walter was not a good man. Mine was that Walter was going to be physically abusive and maybe already married, and also that he couldn't paint at all, just based on that scene near the beginning of the movie where, again, they're in the park And he doesn't put anything on the canvas like he doesn't even do a sketch. Maybe that was an extremely obvious clue to everyone involved, but I noticed it too. So what did I think was magic about the movie? Starting out with the Andy Warhol quote about mainstream popularity, I really liked that. You know, if someone gives you flack 
for liking something that is popular in the mainstream but not considered like high art, just whip that quote at them and they'll probably say, okay, well, Andy Warhol was part of the problem and I can't help you there. But try that one. See how that works for you. First off, I love Amy Adams. I think she is a princess. I absolutely love her voice. I love her like soft little southern accent in this one and it's really fun to hear her use that accent and that like soft voice when she starts to get angry as an artist i really liked the scene of her at the art fair spraying the fixative really fast on the paper because i've been working on oil pastels lately and literally have not bought any fixative so i'm just like carefully putting my finished papers in between other pieces of paper and hoping that it all works out I really liked seeing Jason Schwartzman this time, and I was happy to see him in Asteroid City. That movie just irked me, but I loved him in this um, as the like manager of that modernist gallery. And I just recently saw a thread about how you're not supposed to show up to galleries with artwork in your trunk and show up asking them to put it up in the gallery for you. I really figured that that was a rule, but of course... We need to see how tacky Walter is. Like, we need to see how tacky and desperate Walter is. Terrence Stamp is an absolute gift, and he was really perfect for the art critic because he can be frightening. He usually makes me laugh more just by being Terrence Stamp, but he didn't make me laugh too much in this one, and that's okay. That wasn't his job. I really liked the movie addressing the fact that if Walter was behind all of the paintings, what What was his inspiration? He was a man that until like two thirds or halfway through the movie, we didn't know had children of his own. So why is he painting children, mostly little girls? It could potentially be not considered entirely wholesome. So it was nice to see the movie touch on that subject for sure. I noted early in the movie that Christoph Waltz, Walter didn't seem all that bad. And it's like, yeah, you were fooled by a very charming abuser. A lot of abusers are extremely charming. They can draw people in and fool them and make them comfortable. So I did like his progression from seeming kind of like a charming, goofy, like overly enthusiastic man to realizing that he's actually a monster. There were obviously clues earlier on the movie. I don't think the switch flipped too quickly. And in regards to Margaret Keane's actual artwork, I'm not a fan of all of it. I can fully understand why anyone would be really creeped out by it, especially the ones where there's just a group of children looking at you, looking maybe a little sickly and alien-like, and the light's always shining from, like, above them. They have this big shadow across their eyes, which I find fascinating, but... I actually think it's a really cool style and it's perfect for Tim Burton, right? Because it it's kind of like creepy cute and he's usually pretty good at that. I'm thinking like Frank and Weenie and I love the newer style she started working in in the 60s. I immediately wanted to get a print for my office after seeing those. I have no interest in deciding for the world if what she created was art. She was an artist. She created art and so she's an artist. A painter paints. Is it necessarily my thing? No, not really. But I can see the appeal. And I don't totally hate big-eyed art. I'm going to let you in on a secret here about my art. The eyes are always too big. I just love the eyes. I think it's fun. I think it's fun to make people a little cartoony. And, of course, I grew up with Bratz dolls and Powerpuff Girls. So it makes sense that mm, I just like big-eyed stuff. I loved her, like, psychosis starting to see people with large eyes like her paintings, possibly because all she does is paint the big-eyed people. The supermarket scene was excellent. I wish they sold Margaret Keene prints in my supermarket. I also like that, according to the movie, she got into numerology. Listen, once you read your first book about numerology, you can't stop. Whether you even remember what the numbers mean, sometimes you'll be like, huh, what's the numerology behind someone's birthday? And then you'll sit there adding the numbers up like they taught you to do. Basically, I'm saying that 15 years ago, I briefly read about numerology and then did no other research about it. But I really love that nod to numerology. And of course, 
watch a man listen to a woman talking about one of her interests and just think it's like "Mm -hmm, silly woman things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know what's magic? That house they buy in California. Oh my gosh. I'll move in right now. I'm ready. Give me the keys. I liked that pre Christoph Waltz. She was wearing color. And then during her relationship with him and obviously the turmoil he puts her through, she's wearing black. And then when she moves to Hawaii, she's wearing color again. I liked when she confronts him about not even being the artist behind the repetitive Paris paintings. He's literally backed into a corner in that scene. Like they're filming it right into a tiny little corner in the house. I think it's interesting that he lures her in to the like UNICEF World's Fair painting deal with the premise of helping children. And of course, Christoph Waltz's like volatile narcissistic performance in the courtroom and him questioning himself. I thought that was pretty magic. I think his character overall took it 80% of the way. I was never fully delighted by him or like outright laughing and I was never fully afraid of him. But we'll get into that when we talk about what I felt was mystifying. And what I thought was the most magic of the movie was that one scene where she goes into her studio and she's talking to the little white poodle, who's so cute, by the way. And it's dark in the room, but she's lit from each side with this gold light. And she looks at him and basically says something like, you know, I painted that. The energy in that scene, I really wish we had seen duplicated throughout the entire movie. But I think that scene to me was like showing a glimmer of what I think Tim Burton is capable of or what maybe he he was capable of. I'm not sure. So let's move on to mystifying, because I probably have as much that I felt was mystifying as much as I thought was magic. I don't think the movie did a great job of showing that her likenesses were pretty good. From what I've seen, when someone sat for a portrait from her, the painting ended up looking like them, but in her style. So I'd like to give her some credit for that first. And also, I didn't go into this movie thinking that it was like exactly what happened. It said based on true events. I think we can all expect that from movies. They're going to make an entertaining story from kind of like a vague recollection. When I first started watching the movie, I was looking out for the first, like, Tim Burton lady to show up. I I feel like Tim Burton fans will understand what I mean. Like, what was the first woman who looked like she was drawn by Tim Burton who shows up in the movie? And I'm going to say that's Kristen Ritter. She has a nice, more sort of gothy contrast to Amy Adams' character, for sure. The score to the movie. Danny Elfman. I would not have even known that that was Danny Elfman doing it. And I wasn't asking for like the most quintessential Danny Elfman score, but I would have had no idea that this was him at all. And I kind of felt the score was generic. And the Lana Del Rey song in the movie worked. The Lana Del Rey song at the end of the credits bothered me and I don't think worked, but I saw a lot of people really happy about it in the Letterboxd review, so I will let them have that. I think one of the worst parts about the movie is the narrator who's played by Danny Houston. I think it's fine for him to play the reporter. I don't see the point of him being the narrator. I did like the scene where he's narrating and suddenly he shows up. I thought that was clever, but I think the movie was showing us everything that was happening. Um, As usual, anything they wanted to tell us, they could have just showed us and we didn't need the narrator. And we definitely didn't need his whole thing about women leaving their husbands being fashionable. Women leaving their husbands was starting to be feasible, not fashionable. I didn't think that was funny. I know I mentioned that I didn't think Christoph Waltz was as funny or as frightening as he could have been. I think he did both of those things fairly well. And I don't really blame him for not getting there all the way. I think I maybe blame the script and the direction. I just kind of found him more off-putting than anything. The scene in the restaurant where he's just straight up threatening to kill her. She goes, are you threatening me? Yes. He just like comically threatens to have a mobster kill her. That scene definitely took the movie to a whole other level. 
I thought the scene where Terrence Stamp like grabs his arm when he's about to stab him with a fork was not believable at all. It seemed impossible to me. Sometimes I feel like when a Tim Burton movie has to do some kind of choreography like that, it doesn't work. And this one didn't work. Honestly, I found the whole scene where he's throwing matches into the lock, like he's throwing matches at her and her daughter Jane, was mystifying as a whole. I know that they're frightened. I know that they're probably not trying to make too many quick movements so that he doesn't just attack them because he's a terrifying, abusive, violent man. But he, they run into her studio and he's throwing matches into the office right next to the turpentine. She doesn't just pick up the cans. Of course, she like accidentally kicks them. So then the turpentine's on the carpet. But I was confused as to why they didn't just leave out the door in the studio. I don't know. I'm expecting a lot from two people actively going through a violent experience. But I was kind of just yelling at the screen. There's a door there. There's a door there. But he, I guess he would have seen them because the whole that whole side of the house is windows. I want to know how she got the money for that big, beautiful house in Hawaii. It's stuff like that. I know they don't need to explain everything, but they left California with nothing. So what did she do to get that big house? You know, movies think that we aren't going to notice those things. Sometimes I think movies think we're stupid. So the last thing I felt was mystifying is in the courtroom scene, They really gave James Saito some tough lines to work with. I see that he was the original Shredder in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So he's probably just well versed in saying outrageous things. But did anyone else think the lines they gave him were a little bit wild? Maybe that's just me. So what did I think was memeable? They're on honeymoon in Hawaii and Amy Adams runs toward the camera and says, only God could create these colors. I was saying that for like 10 minutes after, and now I'm just going to keep saying it. Only God could create these colors. Uh, Finding out that Christoph Waltz's character only lived in Paris for a week. I guess that was probably another clue that he hadn't actually painted all of those Paris scenes. The woman in the gallery who describes her work as creepy, maudlin, and amateurish. I love it. And there's room for all kinds of artwork, I think, in the world. And people loved that creepy maudlin amateurish shit, okay? And obviously the message is that it was very popular to the mainstream. The creepy maudlin amateurish stuff was very well loved. The scene at the radio station where he says something like, is it true your husband Walter is the top selling painter in the world? And she says, no big Lolo. Oh my God, I love no big Lolo. Also the line, is Jehovah okay with suing? It's so good. I can totally understand why she would turn to, you know, religion and community, having been so, like, isolated and lonely for so many years and just seeking some kind of meaning. I get it. And I do like that her fellow, like, Jehovah's Witnesses friends continue to show up after that in the movie. So that's it for memeable. Is this a movie that I would watch again? I don't know. I think that if like a friend hadn't seen it yet and I know they'd like it, I would definitely watch it again with them. But I just don't think that the movie delivered overall. If you hadn't told me it was a Tim Burton movie, I would have had no idea. And that's not completely a criticism because I do like when Tim Burton kind of lays off the pedal of his like really strong stylistic choices and handles something like this you know, like a less stylized biopic. And I can imagine the movie was very respectful of Margaret Keene. I do wonder if that's the reason why it wasn't weirder, but I wish it had been weirder. I wish there had been more scenes like the camera looking up at her talking to the dog, you know, but overall, I feel like it's not a tragedy and it's not a triumph. And as a result, it just kind of feels like Tim Burton was phoning it in a little bit. But I didn't see a huge vision. I don't know. It was just missing some major hook for me. So what's my mood? I would have to say I'm feeling motivated. I think I'm going to clean the house a little bit after this. And I've been working on my art more. I feel like I've had more of a direction lately than I did at the beginning of the winter and even last fall. Recently made kind of a larger um, financial decision personally that I'm feeling pretty good about. And even though it's like day 52, 
of not seeing any proper sunlight through the clouds, I still feel like getting things done. I mean, I made a to-do list and it's Saturday, so I feel good about that. What's your mood? Are you also feeling motivated or are you feeling the opposite of motivated? Because that's fine too. Whatever you're feeling, feel it. And I want to ask you all a question. If you could write an album based on a musician's life, which musician would it be? Hmm. Ponder that and let me know. And please tell me what you are listening to, watching, and feeling on the Movies, Music, and Moods Instagram. That is at Movies, Music, and Moods. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, please feel free to share it with someone who you also think would like it or send it to someone you don't like as punishment. I just want to say if you made it this far, thank you so much for listening. I seriously appreciate every single listen I get on this podcast that isn't, you know, just me testing it in Spotify. So thank you again and we'll talk soon.